If there's one thing that I feel almost always typifies a good candidate for an episode of Cult Classifications, it's an interesting premise. And that's something that Yaiba Ninja Gaiden Z has for days. Think of it, an alternate take on the Ninja Gaiden series where one of the random goons that Ryu Hayabusa has slaughtered over the years comes back to take his revenge on the stoic shinobi. It's a concept that's not only interesting in and of itself, but that also adds an additional layer of intrigue and humanity to every other entry in the series, because it means each foe slain could have been a Yaiba. Add in some zombies because it's the early 2010s and that's just what you do, and you've got yourself a hit. Or you should anyways, unless you fucked it up somehow. What a load of shit. Honor and death go together like hot sauce in my balls. I did die, but now I'm back. Back for the son of a bitch who murdered me. I'm coming for you, Ryu Hayabusa. But first, I need a little practice. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Oh no. This is... This is not the tone I expected after that initial announcement. And even this E3 trailer doesn't really show the game's actual vibe either, but... I'll get into that. Also important to note, this gameplay looks not good. What what happened here? Why is it like this? Ah, yes. Now it's starting to become clear. I remember being so very excited for this game before it launched and having faith that the concept alone was meaty enough that any developer could make it shine. Unfortunately, I was wrong. That's not to say there are not some redeeming aspects to Yaiba, but if you are at all familiar with Concept's other major creation, Mighty Number no. 9, then you have a good idea as to how all of this played out. <laughs> our story starts off with a flashback, showing our crass anti-hero Yaiba squaring off against Ryu in a bamboo thicket, and going full-on samurai movie, massive gouts of blood included. Let's make up for lost time. Where's your ball gag? It's one of the coolest scenes in this game by far, but all of that excitement is immediately drained when we then cut to a low-effort motion comic. Here, it's shown that Yaiba has since been resurrected as a cyborg and has swiftly been dumped into an unspecified area of Eastern Europe that's been infested with zombies in order to hunt down Ryu Hayabusa. This level is there mostly to act as a tutorial as we bounce between rooftops and learn the ins and outs of Yaiba's new augments from his handler and savior, the Sultry Miss Monday. We'll go into the deeper nuances of gameplay later on, but it's made clear from the get-go that this isn't going to be the Ninja Gaiden we're all familiar with. There's a greater focus on crowd control and QTEs, with even the platforming having been streamlined. It's a more western-style approach to character action, which makes sense given that Spark Unlimited was the core developer behind this game. This is all capped off with that other classic early 2010 staple, the helicopter boss fight, before Yada makes his way down to street level and we get a little scene between him, Monday, and their benefactor Del Gonzo, the Latin playboy owner of Forge Industries. 
He's the one who has paid for all of Yaiba's fancy new implants and has flown him out here to the Eastern Bloc. Yaiba, of course, treats him with the expected level of respect and candor. It's also revealed that Delgonzo has had a kill switch built into Yaiba's new bits for if he goes off script, meaning Yaiba is forced to play along with him. Thankfully, Delgonzo wants the same thing that our titular Ninja Slayer does, Ryu Hayabusa's head, and their target is somewhere out there trying to stem the outbreak. Why Delgonzo wants Ryu dead isn't made clear, but Yaiba doesn't especially care and heads off to the city streets to try and track his prey down. Monday quickly gets a hold of us once the level starts and directs Yaiba towards a Forge Industries listening post where we can get a better overview of the situation. But getting there will require us to go on a lengthy walking tour of the city. We'll get to weave through some back alley brawls against some bruisers and bozos, pass through a massive graveyard with an opulent attached Eastern Catholic Cathedral, and witness the devastation being caused overall with even fighter jets being brought down and smoldering in the streets. It's still unclear exactly where this is all taking place, but Delgonzo does refer to the city as Kataev at one point. Or rather... Ah, uh, Kataev, Jewel of the Black Sea. Which is also a nickname for Odessa in Ukraine. Crimea was being annexed around the time of this game's release, so maybe they decided to change the names around last minute for the sake of sensitivity. As for why they called it Kataev instead, uh, the best I can figure is that it's a reference to Valentin Kataev, a Soviet author from the early 20th century who was actually from Odessa and did write some amount of proto-sci-fi, though I'm not familiar enough with his work to say if it included zombies or anything else brought up in this game. While the name of the city itself might be a bit of pointless trivia, it does allude to how stylish Kataev is, and honestly how much the game in general really pops visually. It does also kind of look like dog shit at points, mostly due to some really chunky flat models and low-res textures that wouldn't be out of place on the PS2, but they hide a lot of that with the art style, which has a very distinct Mike Mignola sort of look to it that is then further enhanced with some harsh cell shading. While the finer details are often obscured by the atrocious camera that frames every moment in this game like a drunken wannabe handyman with a busted level, it does get to shine when they focus in and show off their enemy models and do some wider artistic shots. Most of the special zombies look great and pack a ton of character into their animations and designs, and the environments, when they get the chance to open up, really do show some nice vistas that make it feel like they thought these levels through. It's just unfortunate that most of the time you will only see flashes of this quality thanks to all the filters and darkness and shoddy camera placement constantly obscuring a better look at what this game has on offer. It feels like they traded any sense of clarity for style in hopes that they could hide the rougher edges, and I think at the end of the day, they got the short end of that stick. That attitude especially comes through in the cutscenes you get to cap off each level, as they're just motion comics, as was typical of budget releases at the time, and even by that measure, they're very low quality ones at that. There's little actual animation to be seen, displaying mostly just transitionary movements, and they're incredibly brief. It's a step below even some of the more amateurish machinima I've seen, and it makes what should be big, bombastic moments in the story almost unintelligible with how quickly they pass by and how poorly they're portrayed. Moving on to the audio side of things, the music is generic to a fault. It's a dull, throbbing conglomeration of dubstep, industrial music, and techno that would have felt extremely dated even before this game launched, and it underlines every moment of Yaiba's journey. It's not bad, necessarily, but it has zero character of its own, and doesn't ever really scream Ninja Gaiden at any point. It's just this bland, overused white noise machine of an OST that never really connects with the experience as a whole. Also, and this is a more personal reaction to it, it reminds me of my days as a bathroom attendant. You see, when I was younger, I spent about six months doling out cologne and breath mints in the bathroom of a nightclub, and most of that experience was spent trapped in a small, sweaty, tiled room while mediocre, awful house music blared outside bleeding through the crack of the door, rumbling the fixtures, but still muted by the layers of human filth and cocaine residue that surely hid between the walls. 
It was a special kind of purgatory, not, not quite hell, not ever truly painful, but the sort of repugnance and constant discomfort which evokes such a deep existential ennui that it just it sticks with you, it, it clings to your bones. And the music in this game brings back cold PTSD memories of that time for me. Editing Matt here, sorry for the sloppy voice work on this, but I had to stop things briefly for a correction. As it turns out, the soundtrack for this game is actually better than I thought. And digging up the raw files and listening to some of it divorced from the rest of the action, while it is still really generic, there are some solid riffs and interesting instrumentation present that does elevate it above being just white noise. Here, have a listen. This stuff just doesn't really get to shine as often as it should because it's really low in the mix, with only that dreadful, thumping main theme ever really surfacing properly. Hence my original impression of the OST from playing the game and just watching my footage back. As that is the experience that most people will have, I do think my comments still hold water, but I did want to make sure I was doing my due diligence and giving credit where it was due, as this soundtrack does deserve better. Anyways, back to the show. That all being said, the soundtrack is at least technically competent, which is more than I can say for the VO work. Right off the bat, you're dealing with a real mixed bag of performances. Delgonzo is gloriously chewing the scenery and having fun at least. Dickhead. Hello, my cyborg friend. I hear that you are having difficulties following orders. I told him to go fuck himself. Oh. Such an act where I to attempt it would confuse and sadden me, Aiba, and it would force me to reveal that the power cord keeping you alive has a kill switch I can activate at any time. And murder leaves such a bad taste in my mouth. But then, on the other end of things, you have Troy Baker's take on Ryu Hayabusa, a ninja ardently, desperately searching for one thing a fucking paycheck. Not that I can blame him given the material. I thought you were dead. I was. Now it's your turn. Your arm. That's Forge Industries tech. Do you even know that Delgonzo started this disaster? Eh, well, what can I say? Miss Monday has some good lines here and there at least, along with some solid delivery, but rarely ever gets to shine. The same goes for Yaiba, as there just isn't really much for either of them to work with. Making it worse is how bad things get on a technical level with Yaiba, as he's constantly peaking the mic and they never thought to correct the levels, or just get another take, I guess. Dude sounds like he's deep throating the damn thing half the time. It even acts as a black mark on some of the funnier moments in the game. Speaking of which, let's get back to our romp through Fodessa. After a bit more wandering and some puzzles, Yaiba arrives at the lingerie store hiding the listening post, and proceeds to create an entrance in a way befitting this game's sense of humor. preferred women's underwears to men's. If Carlin, your maracas is wrong, then I don't want to be right. Who's this bad fiery fuck? Who 
whoever he is, he's ruining my fucking panty party. As crass as it is, this is genuinely one of my favorite moments in the game. Because it's just so wonderfully dumb in an almost heartfelt way. Anyways, after we slap around this debaucherous former bishop, we make our way down into the base and find out it's been compromised as well, with all the staff turned into zombies who are diligently still at their posts. Unfortunately, despite the outbreak, the security system still works, and we're forced into a shoddy boss fight against a giant robot dog that will be repeated multiple times throughout the rest of this game as filler. After taking it down, Yaiba learns that Hayabusa has been through here, having neatly sliced up the station's staff before proceeding into the sewers. He's going to the Lazarev Institute, the presumed source of the zombie infestation, so Yaiba heads off after him, continuing on his hunt. The sewers start off with us getting to see a 3D reconstructed still of Ryu doing his ninja thing on some guards, all while Delgonzo fills us in with some very scant details about what is going on exactly, before Yaiba gets a slap on the ass and is sent on his way. 3D stills like this are all the actual story we're going to get in this level, so let's use this narrative lull to talk about the gameplay, starting off with how this game approaches its combat, as that really is where you're going to be spending the bulk of your time here. Zeds aside, having Ninja Gaiden in the title implies a certain sense of what this game should feel like. The specific brand of deliberate and balletic hyper-violent action from Ninja Gaiden 1 and 2 has an unmistakable signature to it, and for all the issues with Ninja Gaiden 3, it does still feel like it walks in those footsteps. Yaiba, on the other hand, feels like an entirely different beast, for better and for worse. Mostly for worse. It's still a character action game, of course, but it takes a more western approach to the concept, trading the flow and precision you see in games like Devil May Cry and, of course, Ninja Gaiden, for a weightier and more impactful and animation-driven style that you would see in games like the old-school God of Wars and, finally enough, DMZ, a reboot which arose from similar circumstances to Yaiba, but we'll get into that later. This uh, corn-fed take on combat isn't a problem in and of itself, and there's actually a lot to praise here. Not only does it retain a nice snappiness and speed, but there's a raw, reckless abandon to the moveset that really fits Yaiba as a character and makes this title stand out from its peers. When they get their encounter design right, hitting you against large hordes of rotten wheat to cut down with the occasional special super zombie thrown in, Ninja Gaiden Z even manages to excel and creates this fantastic flow where you're essentially working out a combat puzzle, treating your foes more as resources than just obstacles. This is thanks to both an early and surprisingly well-done version of a glory kill system, a la Doom 2016, and super zombies having body parts that can be turned into special, limited-use weapons. It means you end up looking at encounters and thinking about the best way to take on different groups in the most efficient way possible, ensuring there's always fodder zombies left to glory farm health from, and planning out the best order to take down the super zombies so that you've always got the best toolset on hand for taking out the next group. With each fight being arena-based to boot and scored accordingly, and with those points then being fed back into an admittedly weak level up and perk system, you have external incentives as well to be as cleanly ruthless as you can. When all these elements click, there is genuine fun to be had here. But the issue is it didn't manage to maintain that level of design synergy for very long, allowing that flow and fun to completely fall apart by the end. As I said, this game is working at its absolute best when you're fighting larger hordes of basic enemies, with stronger ones shuffled in. But that balance quickly gets thrown out of whack in the latter half of the game as they push you into fights with a continuous onslaught of small groups of spongy super zombies who all hit like trucks. Not only does this remove that wonderful management of undead resources that I just gushed over, but Yaiba's moves don't feel tailored for focusing down and dueling stronger foes in this manner. His offensive moveset almost entirely consists of these wide, wild swings and big wind-ups, perfect for sending a group of chaff flying, but limp and unwieldy against foes that can actually tank those hits, who will then proceed to slap your shit thanks to the heaps of recovery frames that Yaiba's big moves all seem to come with. Not helping those shit-slapping matters any further are Yaiba's defensive techniques, which are, to be blunt, a fucking nightmare. You've got a touchy block that seems to only defend in the direction that Yaiba is facing, something that's not always intuitive thanks to this game's abysmal fixed camera, a dodge that would be half-decent if it could cancel attacks, but this game unfortunately loves its animation priority, and a seemingly useful parry, 
that is in actuality just a bad joke. The window on it varies massively between enemy attacks, and the timing for it is so wickedly tight and yet frustratingly consistent that your muscle memory will never manage to settle into it. That was the case for me anyways, as I could never reliably work it into the flow of regular combat, no matter how hard I tried. And apparently I'm not the only one, as only 2.2% of people on Steam have the achievement for entering the slow-mo that a successful parry provides a total of only 50 times. I suspect this issue comes from the parry not cancelling your attack animations, or perhaps just not cancelling them fast enough, it's hard to say. Regardless, it's really only good for reflecting projectiles with how it's been implemented here, and that's because they move slow and the window for those seems to be about a mile wide. It makes sense, as this is what they used to tutorial the mechanic in the first place. Not that it means you're safe from projectiles naturally, as enemies tend to spam those in ladder levels and most of them have a healthy dose of splash damage attached for good measure. Splash damage which carries with it elemental status effects, because fuck you! Of course it does, why not? You see, one of the key wrinkles to both the Iba's combat and its puzzles is an interlocking set of three elements that are attached to a large chunk of the enemy roster, the weapons you tear off of them, and a whole whack of interactable objects in the environment. These all act as status ailments too, working in the same way they do in Dark Souls, where you don't get inflected with the ailment until you take on a certain amount of specific elemental damage. You've got fire, which, as you can imagine, sets you on fire and does ongoing damage, electricity, which disables Yaiba's robo-bits, locking away a good 60% of his moveset, and toxic goo, which covers the screen in green and sort of blinds you. These all affect the enemies and the environment in roughly the same fashion, and more importantly you can combine them to devastating effect. Mixing fire with electricity creates a massive electrical storm. Mixing with goo, on the other hand, creates intense white-hot flames, and throwing goo and lightning together makes crystals, for some reason. Using these combined effects creatively is not only helpful in trudging through the combat, especially the later encounters where they're just stacking big tanky fuckers against you left and right, but it is the singular thing they designed all of their puzzles around, which litter this sewer. Speaking of the sewer, let's skip back to the story for a second. As Yaiba proceeds deeper into the sewers, slicing and dicing through various flavors of zombies, he eventually stumbles across another security camera scene that Monday can 3D reconstruct for him. This one reveals that fan-favorite Ninja Gaiden character, Momiji, has also been dragged into this loathsome affair, forever staining her legacy of video game appearances. Yes, even more so than her future cameos in the DOA volleyball games. As for why she's here, it seems to be so that she can do some general ninja magic shit on Ryu's behalf, as well as provide further material for bad sex jokes. With those to look forward to, Yaiba moves onward through some more of the sewers, clearing out undead as well as platforming, finding collectibles, and solving more elemental puzzles. As you may have guessed, those puzzles are completely brain dead, by the way, because while the elemental system is interesting enough, it's absurdly simple, and as such most of these conundrums consist of nothing more than slotting the right color of the zombified block into the right funky looking hole. A thing should be set on fire? Chuck a flaming zombie at it. A thing should be powered up? Chuck a brain-eating battery at it. A thing needs to be goopy? Goop it. And then chuck another element at it for good measure. This is every puzzle in the game, which you'll do in various combinations with no step up in complexity, or difficulty in execution, as this game seems to believe you have the mental capacity of a kindergartner. They do at least try to make things more tricky with all of the collectibles in the game. There are pickups you can find that increase your life bar, provide some elemental resistance, and give you some text logs packed with just, just, just the worst jokes, and they're generally pretty well hidden. Sometimes they're within arm's reach, found by simply heading in the opposite direction at the start of a stage, or by breaking open an obvious door, but sometimes they're significantly harder to find, really dug into the various nooks and crannies of the levels, and requiring that detective vision mode to find. One particular trick they pull a couple of times is hiding them within the platforming route, having you go off course quickly to snag one. Oh, which I guess means I have to talk about the platforming now. The platforming in this game is... depressing. It comes in rigid sections that take the form of essentially extended QTEs, with you stringing inputs together to jump, swing, and smash your way around obstacles, all with pretty colored lights to guide you along. Each of these is a straight line, those little collectible turnoffs notwithstanding, and has all of the challenge and tactile pleasure of playing an old busted game of Simon. While failing an input is a one-hit kill, no matter what, which is dumb, that doesn't matter because the timing for all of these is generally piss easy and won't cause you any trouble. 
you'll breeze through these most of the time, which makes it all the more disappointing that they end this level with one. Speaking of which, let's get back to it. So after plowing through even more bullshit of both the gameplay and fecal varieties, this is a sewer after all, Yaiba finds a big honkin' furnace that apparently powers half the Lazarev Institute. Why it's in the sewers is unclear at best, but it's here, and it needs to be destroyed, because... Fuck it. In order to achieve this, you do a couple more shitty elemental puzzles to light the candle, and then watch the thing blow itself to Kingdom Come, which leads to a flat and anticlimactic escape sequence, where you escape the sewers and are deposited cleanly on the outskirts of the Institute. <laughs> As Yaiba works his way through the Cold War era facility, we eventually find more traces of Ryu and Momiji, and see that they're planning to blow the place up using the ancient art of the Nimpo Nuke, in a bid to hopefully stop the outbreak. We also learn that Ryu has gotten his hands on a notebook containing all of the original research surrounding Compound 72, the proper name for the green ooze that's been reanimating the dead, and those notes would be key to either stopping or extending the zombie plague. It's also here we start getting some really obvious hints that Delgonzo's true aim in all of this is to secure the source of Compound 72 for his own nefarious ends, with him gearing up to stab Yaiba in the back, which is not a surprise. Yaiba is established to be a bad guy. Delgonzo, also clearly a bad guy. We're all bad guys, that's what this fucking story is about. I don't know where, between the gleeful cackling gouts of blood and scads of off-color jokes, you get any other impression. Speaking of which, now is a good time to discuss this game's sense of humor, both where it fails and where some genuine chuckles manage to shine through. As we've already covered, Ninja Gaiden Z has a particular sensibility when it comes to its jokes, largely going for gloriously gaudy edgelord humor reveling in sex and violence and gleeful misanthropy in a way I would normally appreciate, to be honest. That is, until it starts mixing in lots of lol random gags and references that, just like the dubstep soundtrack, feel so dated and rotted they might as well be compost. While sometimes its attempts at dark humor work, more often than not they fall flat, both because it's watered down with those attempts at more lighthearted gags, and because overall it's just trying way too hard. This game wants to be seen as pithy, and cool, and transgressively offensive, but instead it just ends up coming off as intensely unlikable and kinda pitiful, really. Like that wannabe class clown back in grade school who spent lunchtime eating worms for a laugh. While I feel like this was hopefully at least somewhat intended and meant to be ironic, it doesn't make it any less unpleasant to sit through. This foul energy all centers around Yaiba as well, with every offhanded line and overwritten text log pushing this idea that Yaiba is just the most badass motherfucking ninja to ever have lived, with even his move list being crammed full of pointless, silly bravado and dated memes. During the penultimate level, they even go so far as to imply that he has a giant dick. Not only does this all end up feeling just utterly pathetic, but it actually ruins the premise of the game in my mind. By trying to build up Yaiba as this legendary, unhinged, godlike ninja slayer, it undercuts that initial good idea of a regular, random goon getting a chance at revenge, and in contrast, it makes Ryu Hayabusa far less frightening and monstrous as an antagonist. I'm not saying this game should have been played entirely straight, mind you, but treating Yaiba as an actual underdog instead of all of this reading like bad fanfiction would have made for a far more interesting take on the concept. One that I think this developer could have handled. Hell, there is actually some good, old-school subtle humor in this very game that shows that at least someone on that staff understood how to be funny. Effortlessly cool, we-don't-give-a-fuck style humor was clearly the goal here. And when they stick to not giving a fuck and are more laid back with their jokes, they have a tendency to actually land. You get a few fun lines here and there that manage this, coming from Miss Monday and Algonzo as they chew the scenery, but the real stars of the show on this front are the zombies. <laughs> E 
each new zombie type you run into gets their own intro. And these intros are all done as classic, wordless, cartoony gags that more often than not manage to at least get a smile out of me. They're goofy, and fun, and feel like they're taking the piss out of the game as a whole, almost rebelling against the hyper-edgy energy of Yaiba himself. Your scanner indicates these guys are practically bursting with Compound 72 from Lazaro. If I were you, Yaiba, I wouldn't let that shit anywhere near you, or your systems. <laughs> Even outside of these intros, you'll get some great idol animations that have that same vibe. It reminds me very specifically of Gremlins 2, a movie Joe Dante really didn't want to make. So he intentionally had fun with it and made it a farce. <laughs> this kind of humor works really well for the threadbare story they're telling here, and the overall anarchic tone they clearly wanted this game to have. But it's ultimately put aside in favor of stock standard dick jokes and edgelord nonsense. If they had leaned more into the goofy zombie stuff, this could have been a genuinely funny game in a way that would have compensated for some of the issues with its gameplay. But even so, I worry it's a tone they wouldn't have been able to maintain, because even with the lame, dated, edgy stuff they did end up focusing on, they never really give those gags a chance to breathe. This game has a breakneck pace, and as a result, is constantly talking over itself, never letting a joke land before the next one is told. It's exhausting. This is exemplified in the text logs that they constantly throw at you via collectibles, which are long-winded and caked in painfully unfunny, rapid-fire attempts at potty humor. Take, for example, this in-depth character pitch for the legendary Kataya Vigilante, Ponycock. Anyways, moving away from this game's sad excuse for comedy and back to the story, Yaba continues to work his way through the rest of the facility, jumping around, solving puzzles, and even killing a giant zombie baby that had been stalking us through the sewers. He eventually finds the source of Compound 72, a big, glowing, skyscraper-sized drill off in the distance. Knowing that Ryu must be there, Yaiba heads over to finally exact his revenge. Ryu is naturally there waiting for him. Surprised, but not shaken to see Yaiba alive, he reveals that, shocker, Delgonzo was the one behind this whole zombie uprising thing. It seems Hayabusa had been on his trail for quite some time, and when Delgonzo realized he was onto him, he had his men rupture the C-72 holding tanks to cause some chaos and create a distraction. This revelation is of course all just white noise to Yaiba, as he doesn't give a hot shit about the zombies and just wants to kill Ryu. This whole level is one big fight with Ryu, the headline attraction for this game, fulfilling the premise upon which it was sold in the first place. And it sucks! It's split into two parts, with this first having us chase Ryu down inside this drill building while he takes pot shots at us with his bow. It's just the same standard platforming and puzzle challenges they've been throwing at us as filler for a while now, but with the extra annoyance of being treated as a human pincushion. It at least ends with a super cool transition by having Ryu Izuna drop Yaiba a distance of a couple kilometers, which really helps provide some hype to what is otherwise a very limp level. You've done well, but it's all for nothing. Fuck yeah! <laughs> ah, shit!
It's also revealed here that Compound 72 is actually the blood of some long-dead alien god monster that the Soviets discovered and decided to drill into, with them pumping 100% pure ghoulseline straight from its corpse for decades now. As you can guess, Ryu and Momiji are planning to blow the thing up, stopping the flow of Ecto Cooler, much to Del Gonzo's horror and dismay. What then follows is a series of mano a mano fights between Yaiba and Ryu, with you chasing the two ninjas down as they take out the various bits of this extraterrestrial cadaver. These fights would be a lot of fun too, if it weren't for the fact that Ryu seems to be playing an actual Ninja Gaiden game, whereas you're still playing Ninja Gaiden Zed. All of the issues I brought up about the combat a couple stages ago raise their ugly heads here. Ryu attacks too relentlessly for most of your bigger moves to be useful thanks to the high amount of recovery frames, he moves so fast as to easily dance around Yaiba's wide and wild swings, and the only real way to disrupt his advance is with that completely dog shit parry system. Despite all that, it's not an impossible fight, mind you. Once your muscle memory falls in sync with this encounter's discordant rhythm, you'll be able to pop off a parry reliably like 30% of the time, which is just enough to push through the fight, but it's still just wholly unpleasant. Even in cutscene, Yaiba will eventually manage to win out over Ryu, including getting to punch out his magical Ninpo dragon, which is admittedly a sick as fuck moment. This does cause the cavern to start to collapse, though, resulting in Momiji falling off a cliff. To save her, Ryu leaps to a rescue, but in doing so leaves them both dangling precariously from the ledge. Yaiba, being the complete piece of shit that he is, decides to let them hang there knowing that Ryu's strength will eventually wane and he'll just drop Momiji, causing him to feel ultimate despair. Dalgonzo, on the other hand, would prefer Yaiba just finish it rather than engage in this Danganronpa bullshit, but, you know, edgelord gonna edgelord. Ryu, in a moment of just completely misjudging Yaiba's character, then pleads him to take the C-72 research notes and to put them in the right hand so a cure can be developed, saying he knows there is a spark of good in our cold, dead, psychotic cyborg soul. Yaiba accordingly then chucks that shit off a cliff. Of course, Dogonzo also wanted those notes, and he's less than pleased at seeing them destroyed, so he activates Yaiba's kill switch in order to destroy all three ninjas in one fell swoop to which Yaiba responds by violently ripping out his own damn heart. Naturally, all of this sounds very exciting, but just like with every other bit of story in this game, it's hugely lit down by the limp, motion-comic cutscenes. Anyways, Ryu then somehow uses this confusion to save Momiji, and briefly pauses to tell Yaiba that he is in fact a total bro, before just bamfing out of there anticlimactically. In a better game, this would be the end of Yaiba's story, but sadly it is not. Three weeks later. After a refreshing near month long nap, Yaiba awakes in a trash heap with a refrigerator battery strapped to his chest and a searing headache. Miss Monday has brought him back from the dead. Again. This time with the intent of stopping Delgonzo, who has gone completely insane. Thankfully, he's not far, as this trash heap is actually located inside of Forge Industries' massive mobile HQ, which is currently trudging across the Antarctic tundra for some godforsaken reason. Zombies are also crawling all over the place, because Monday set them loose after Delgonzo tried to kill her, so you get that to deal with as well. Before Yaba can get to this new case of revenge, though, he has a couple of things to deal with. Chiefly, whatever Delgonzo's larger plan is out here on the ice sheet, and the chunk of frigid air sticking out of his chest. That second thing even factors into gameplay, as Yaiba's new heart is a piece of shit and will constantly build up charge. Left alone, this will eventually overload his robotic components, putting him into that same shock state we've seen before, though thankfully Monday has placed discharge stations in all of the arenas going forward, meaning you need to bounce between fighting zombies and getting rid of your excess charge in order to keep fighting efficiently. This new wrinkle makes the fight through the bowels of the HQ to disable the crawler's engines a bit more tense, but it's still not exactly revolutionary. It's also short-lived, because right after destroying the engines, we make our way to the hangar bay and wreck up another one of those big robot dogs, ripping out its heart and slotting it in to replace our makeshift pacemaker. From here, it's a straight shot to Delgonzo, but naturally that path features some of the most difficult arenas in the game, which makes this a good moment to talk about the level of challenge here overall. Like with its higher quality mainline counterparts, Yaiba is a game that is notorious for being pretty difficult. And while it lives up to that Ninja Gaiden legacy in terms of how much it'll bust your balls, it has none of the finesse or precision to make that feel in any way rewarding or enjoyable. 
A lot of this falls to the game's encounter design, which often focuses on marathon slogs through wave after wave of spongy super zombies that don't ever outmatch you so much as just eventually grind you down. Even worse, enemy numbers and health bars seem to constantly climb as time goes on, meaning that even though you're getting better at the game and unlocking new perks and buffs and all that, you're never actually getting to feel that sense of progression as enemies take longer and longer to defeat in these seemingly endless arenas. It is disheartening, to say the least, as it means there's no sense of mastery here, just tempered but constant annoyance. Making things even worse is the fact that when you do die, and you'll die plenty, you'll be forced to sit through the game's agonizingly long load times as you wait to slam your head into the wall again. I tested it on both a hard drive and an SSD, and in both cases, the load time in between deaths took a full 11 seconds, more than long enough for you to lose your groove and make that next round even harder. It is worth noting, I suppose, that I played on normal and that there are further difficulty modes, including a couple extreme unlockable ones, Though, in toying with the hard mode briefly, all that seemed to do was make the enemies a little spongier, as well as act slightly more aggressively and defensively in combat. While there are certainly more interesting ways it could have handled it, frankly this isn't the sort of game you're going to want to play through more than once anyways, difficulty level regardless, so whatever. Speaking of which, let's wrap this up and go take out the boss man so I can end my torment and stop playing this fucking thing. Making our way through the HQ, ensuring we take a detour through Miss Monday's old office so she can make a joke about defiling Yaiba's corpse in more ways than just turning him into shitty Robocop, we emerge out into a massive rooftop plaza that Delgado has turned into an ancient Aztec temple, complete with River of Blood. We then push through a couple more arenas packed with every enemy type in the game as a sort of penultimate challenge before entering the central ziggurat and finally meeting Delgado face to face. Turns out, he's been pulling a Mr. House on us, and he's actually a shriveled up old husk floating in a tube like the last cuke in a jar of past due pickles. <laughs> Delgonzo uses this tete-a-tete -tete to give us a short monologue, and owns up to the whole killing Ryu thing being a ruse. He was just using Yaiba as a bloodhound, basically, knowing that his hunt for Hayabusa would help him suss out the source of Compound 72. With that goop secured, by the way, he's been pumping a special blend of the stuff into his own veins for, once again, some reason. Immortality or rejuvenation, I suppose. It's magic plot juice. The effects of it are not exactly specific. While he's giving his little spiel, you bang away on his fish tank trying to break the glass. Malgonzo is less than a fan of this, so he kicks things into gear and finishes his transfusion, fusing with a zombie death mech in the process. He now claims himself to be an aspect of Miklantakutli, the Aztec god of the underworld, and given his wide swath of extremely annoying powers, I'm inclined to believe it. It is worth noting, too, that his design is actually pretty on point for what Miklantakutli is supposed to look like in Aztec mythology, according to what I could find. So, once again, someone on the team was actually trying. Anyways, what follows is an absolute slog of a final boss, tediously drawn out over three overlong phases without a checkpoint between them. Even worse, Delgonzo's one-liners and bad jokes are repeated each time through and can't be skipped, often with the fight stopping in its tracks so he can mug to the camera. This means each time you die, and you will die if only from attrition because this fight keeps throwing additional super zombies at you. You are then forced to experience this whole thing over again from the start, ad nauseum, until you eventually manage to break his chest plate, set his guts on fire, lock him in crystal, rip out his heart, set his eyes on fire, and then drop a fucking thunderstorm on him. Once he's finally defeated, the real Delgonzo comes squirming out of the god's head, with Miss Monday somehow showing up in this dread pocket dimension and blowing a cap in his ass. You two then ride off into the sunset together, with plans to go and cure the zombie plague, for profit of course, while the credits roll and a stoic and unhelpful Ryu looks on in despair at what his franchise has become. If you thought that was a short campaign, well you're right. It's only about six hours or so, longer if you get stuck on the final boss for a couple hours like I did, though in my defense I was in the opening throes of a summer flu that night. So what do they offer to extend your playtime beyond just playing it again on a harder difficulty? Well, 
that would be the Ninja Gaiden Z mode that unlocks upon completing the main campaign. This is a simultaneously high and low effort retooling of Yaiba's mechanics and assets into something that is more akin to the NES era Ninja Gaiden games. It comes complete with a surprisingly decent chiptune soundtrack, cringeworthy broken English dialogue, and grody ass looking screenshots run through a pixel filter. The story here is that Yaiba wants to go find his missing bottle of sake, as well as take unearned pot shots at how a series of 20 year old games could be a bit jank, as though this game were some shining example of how far we've come. As for how it plays, it's ultimately just more of the same combat we've already been doing, just with a more consistent camera, an annoying live system, and all the glory kill and elemental mechanics just removed entirely. Overall, it's fine. That's it. It's weird and thrown together, but it is at least a potentially interesting idea, and due to stripping down the combat, it's actually somewhat fun to play. I can't imagine most people will ever touch it, and I'm certainly not going to go back and finish it anytime soon, but I can at least appreciate that they went to the effort to put it in as an extra goodie, if nothing else. Also, as I mentioned, the OST for this mode is really good. It's basically just all the old Ninja Gaiden tracks, but they've expanded them out in a fashion that feels faithful to the franchise in a way the rest of this game most certainly does not. For as basic as this mode is, it feels like someone at least cared about it, even slightly. Which once again, given everything else on display here, is a breath of fresh air. Also, you may have noticed that I'm in a fun kabuki costume in my footage of this mode. That's because this game does give you some alternate outfits once you beat it. That's neither really here nor there though, I just had nowhere else to mention it in the video. It is worth noting that what you're seeing here is only half the selection, as a number of the unlockable costumes were strictly pre-order bonuses that are now lost to time. These outfits were mostly boring, making Yabu shirtless, making him wear camo, making him wear pink, but there is one that uh, sticks out. And it is with that harsh and poorly integrated bit of cross-promotion we remember that Concept and KJ Inafune are involved in all of this. Alongside uh, Spark Unlimited, who Inafune had worked with in the past on Lost Planet 3, and of course Team Ninja, who really should know better than this. So how did this motley crew come together to produce such a flaming pile? Well, the process was actually pretty well documented, and I just so happened to have done my research. The story, as I've been able to put it together, with admittedly a bit of speculation on my end, is that post Itagaki leaving Tecmo, Team Ninja was a bit unsure of what to do with the Ninja Gaiden series. They were already working on 3 at this time, under the same director who made the divisive Sigma ports of Ninja Gaiden 1 and 2, but they were lacking that strong auteur voice that good old Itagaki provided in between bouts of edgy madness. It's at around this time as well that Inafune is wrapping up his tenure at Capcom after the company had produced a string of high-profile flops, all of which were outsourced to lower-budget Western studios in a bid to appeal to Western audiences. This was a practice he was a very vocal proponent of, often saying that the Japanese games industry was dying around this time, and he implemented it across the board when he was global head of production there, much to the rest of the company's chagrin and, obviously, a big reason why he left. He then forms his own company, Comcept, a firm focused on design, production, and concepts, hence the name, rather than proper coding and development, which they would then partner with other outside studios to handle. He then approaches Team Ninja, presumably knowing they're at a bit of a crossroads, and pitches them on a zombie-themed Ninja Gaiden game, something they'd already been thinking about internally, but lacked anyone on staff who felt strongly enough about zombies to pursue it. They knew Inafune had produced Dead Rising, though, and as such had experience and passion for the subject matter. So they made a deal. Part of that was bringing on Spark Unlimited at Inafune's behest, something Team Ninja agreed to because Spark had actually pitched doing a Ninja Gaiden game to them once before, but were rejected. 
As such, Team Ninja knew that they had a love for the brand and could likely be trusted, especially under the eye of a longtime veteran such as Inafune. Put simply, they were making the exact same mistake that Capcom had been making for years and didn't even realize it. Because on the surface, it all made perfect sense and fit with their needs. From here, development begins in California at Spark, with Team Ninja and Comcept providing support from back in Japan, with team members visiting the US team here and there to help efforts along. The game is then revealed not long after that at TGS, and promotion begins, and who oh boy did they pull out some weird shit to try to get people excited for this game, but we'll get into that later. That's because the most interesting bit of promotional material they put out is a rather dry series of interviews and developer diaries featuring Inafune and the director of Team Ninja, Yosuke Hayashi. These chronicle both men's general demeanors from that initial TGS announcement all the way up until launch, and it's an interesting ride, one which I'm sure any forensic psychologist would have a field day with. Well, I'm not one of those, but I can read body language well enough, and the signs of what's happening are pretty clear, so let's dive in. In the first of these interviews, it's mostly about clearing up what this game even is by having Inafune answer questions written by the Team Ninja staff. While the purpose here is to clear things up for the audience, it becomes clear this is more about Inafune allaying Hayashi and the team's worries about what he's doing exactly. This becomes even more pronounced in the next interview when he talks about how development works in Japan versus in the US, comparing it to how houses are built and saying that with American games, development looks slow and rough until the very end when it all just comes together. Throughout both these conversations, Hayashi looks nervous and, and guarded. He slouched inwards, often looking down at the table, and he keeps a distance from Inafune, who in contrast looks relaxed and in control. He's engaged and jovial in conversation, except whenever doubts are cast on the progress of the game or Spark's ability to get things done. It's at these moments you'll occasionally see him stumble a little bit and quickly ramble off some random placation. Throughout the course of these interviews, he gives a lot of non-answers, speaking around the questions posed and offering up a lot of flattery of Team Ninja and Ninja Gaiden as a series. He's working his charisma at every opportunity, even using these interviews as a way to shill the just-launched Kickstarter for Mighty No. 9. Meanwhile, Hayashi, rather than gradually opening up to Inafune, seems to get quieter and quieter with each interview, creating more and more distance between the two of them, something Inafune tries to replicate, presumably to put him at ease. This leads to one of my absolute favorite moments, which comes up during the interview where they're in an arcade to discuss the Ninja Gaiden Z mode. Hayashi starts off the interview leaning off to the side so as to not block the machine, but as has already been the case, he keeps leaning further and further away from Inafune as the interview goes on. Inafune then starts doing this too, and it leads to a shot near the end where they are both nearly horizontal, as they are leaning as far away from one another as humanly possible while you're sitting next to someone. This is not what a healthy, happy, comfortable business relationship is supposed to look like. This just looks unpleasant. It's also at this point in this series of interviews where they start talking about random side stuff like the Ninja Gaiden Z mode and costumes and pre-order bonuses rather than the game itself. Because Hayashi has stated at this point he's seen the milestone builds and presumably he's very worried. These interviews overall present such a heady mix of optimism, anxiety, and pure discomfort disguised as friendliness that I almost can't believe they decided to publish them as marketing material. And then I see the actual dev diaries and they're much worse. These short and surprisingly poorly produced videos follow a number of staff members from all three teams close to the end of development while getting their take on things and some immediate worrying trends start to emerge. Team Ninja, specifically Hayashi, generally appear in more normal locations, like the park or a conference room, and mostly discuss how excited they are to work with Comcept and Spark, and how wild but interesting the game looks to be. The Spark Unlimited staff members, meanwhile, all speak direct from their office in California, and generally talk about the nitty-gritty of development, using a lot of kind of startup-y jargon and buzzwords. They very much feel like they're work for hire, which is understandable. And then we have Comcept, and holy shit, these guys just think they're so fucking cool. Their interviews are done at the bar, or in Inafune's case, in his office filled with gaming knickknacks, and they go into the meaning behind ninjas in the US versus Japan, 
how cool and different Yaiba is as a character, and what this game is going to make you feel. They're just so fart-sniffingly proud of everything they've come up with. And the worst is Inafune, who basically takes ownership over the entire project. When Hayashi, the Spark Team, or even the other members of Concept are speaking, they use the Royal We to discuss the whole development team's efforts. But Inafune, on the other hand, when he talks about the game, he uses I. Despite the fact it's not his franchise, not his code, not his art, not even his writing, this is his game. And he leaves no room for ambiguity in that claim. Admittedly, that is the role of an auteur to some degree, but it still comes off as extremely narcissistic and selfish in my eyes. Clearly a bit overly optimistic too, considering how the game ultimately performed, but that's neither here nor there. Sadly, you also get a sense of general disrespect for Spark Unlimited from these dev diaries, as while everyone on the Team Ninja and Comcept sides are allowed to talk at length, the Spark team is barely featured and regularly has their segments cut off almost mid-sentence. It's fucking crazy. That's what Yaiba really is. It's taking all the cool things that are Ninja Gaiden and, and doing them at their full extreme um, thematically. We've gone through whole lots of iterations to discover where the interesting intersection between the Ninja and the Zombie is. You get the feeling that none of these three studios are really jiving well together, and that this project was an absolute goddamn nightmare for everyone involved. And remember, this is all the promotional material they put out to try and sell this game. I, I can only imagine what things must have looked like behind closed doors. I think this incredibly fake smile from Hayashi in the sixth and final interview between him and Inafune says it all, and speaks volumes about what this whole debacle must have been like. Of course, at the end of the day, Koei Tecmo still had to try and actually promote this damn thing, and they went in some odd directions. There's the aforementioned anime fan on Prom Night crossover costume, as well as some special promotional outfits for DOA 5. There's silly deluxe edition junk, including a zombie-shaped USB key, something that feels dated even for 2014. There's a dreadfully boring tie-in prequel comic produced by Dark Horse, with some questionable art. And the piece de resistance, a fucking blog. Penned in the voice of Yaiba, where he reviews zombie movies. Well, I say review, it's more he just complains about how the people in the movies are dumb, and how he would have just murdered all the zombies because he is in fact so badass and cool, while of course making further cringy off-color jokes. It is gloriously terrible, and sadly now lost to time since they have been the whole site. But the Wayback Machine never forgets. God bless them, they did what they could to try to show some enthusiasm and attempt to hide how clearly not confident they were in this game. That much is clear by how quickly they then pulled out once the game flopped. As evidence, let's look at the Yaiba Twitter account, which prior to launch was very active, engaging with other accounts, sharing fan art, and even holding regular contests and giveaways. And then, on March 18th, 2014, the game launched. A month later, Almost to the day, they put out their final original tweet, and then after a couple of lingering retweets, the account goes completely dead. Yaiba's awful movie reviews also stopped being published around this time, and it's clear Koei Tecmo knew what this game was shaping up to be. Released it as contractually obligated, and then as soon as their fears came to pass, shut down as much promotion as they possibly could. Hell. As far as I can see, they didn't even put out a launch press release for this steaming pile, opting instead to just put out some additional screenshots of bosses a week before launch, the publisher equivalent of promising to call your date the next day and then deleting their number. Not to put too fine a point on it, but Yaiba Ninja Gaiden Z is not a good game. There are bright spots, to be sure, like the concept of using zombie limbs as weapons, the distinctive art style, the occasional glints of decent humor, and of course that 
base premise of a goon seeking revenge that got me so excited in the first place. But none of these things ever really feel fully utilized or allowed to mesh together properly. Instead, they just fill in the gaps with every hacky 7th gen action game trope they can find. I never even mentioned that Yaiba has a stock standard rage mode, and they spackle it all together with a tone that is abrasive at best, and utterly repugnant at worst. I don't blame Team Ninja for this one. As discussed, it feels like they were in a weird spot and unsure of what to do with the franchise, so they greenlit a bad pitch. I don't blame Spark Unlimited either, despite them doing the lion's share of the actual development. Their track record is not exactly outstanding, but I still get the feeling that they tried their best given the circumstances, and like I said, there are some redeeming little nuggets of comedy and design hidden in this turd. No, I lay this game and its many failures at the feet of Inafune and Comcept. After all, he was only too happy to take all the credit in those dev diaries, so it only seems right this be included as part of his illustrious post-Capcom legacy. So, in the end, do I recommend Yaiba Ninja Gaiden Z? Well, no, of course not. But I also don't think it should be completely written off either. The gameplay in the early levels can be a base level of fun, and there is a certain easy acerbic charm to the writing at points that makes all the stupidity work. But it's just not enough. Those very few limited bright points are overshadowed by hulking mountains of ineptitude and poor decision making, which make this game a chore to play and not worth your time at any price. Don't look for it on sale, don't buy it used, just do like Koei Tecmo did, and move on. And that is Yaiba Ninja Gaiden Z all settled up. I didn't necessarily intend for this to be my spooky scary October Halloween game for this year, but uh, given the zombies and general atmosphere, yeah, it works. This one definitely had a bit more history to it than I expected, and once I found those interviews and dev diaries, I knew I had something special on my hands. I'll admit I did dive a bit more into speculation with that than I normally would have, but even so, this game clearly had a very troubled development. Anyways, sorry as always for taking forever to get a new video out. Like I said in my outro for Home for the Revolution, I'm going to be taking my time with these going forward, so you can expect my next video to take just as long, if not longer. Especially because I'll be covering a much-requested 7th gen RPG cult classic that has since been lost to time due to music licensing shenanigans. Until then though, have a good one, and happy Halloween.